Okay, uh, thanks everybody for coming to the AI Town Hall. This is a new experience for us. And uh, I just wanted to start a little bit by um, telling everyone about what is uh, the Technical Committee on Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence. As you may know, the AES has many technical committees in all different areas. We are the newest technical committee of the AES. We were founded in 2021 as kind of an offshoot of a symposium chaired by Jonathan Weiner, of which I helped organize the program, on a symposium for machine learning and audio. It was in 2020 and turned into a virtual symposium, um, as everything in 2020 did. But um, kind of as an offshoot, there were many interesting topics and questions that came up from that, and the technical committee was formed as an offshoot of that event. And um, for the first couple years of our existence, we were, we were really focused on the technical issues. You know, we were having workshops at the AES, such as, um, you know, what are the what are psychoacoustic and perceptual loss functions we can use to teach AI to hear like humans? Or what are, uh, you know, earlier in this convention, uh, Breck Demand, the vice chair of the TCMLAI, organized a panel about uh, deep learning for audio automatic mixing. So we were, we were very much, um, focused on the technical side. And um, with really a goal of, you know, being audio first, everything audio, and then leveraging many of the AES's strengths in terms of psychoacoustics, audio coding, creativity, spatial audio, so trying to be an outlet for MLAI in that area. But uh, as I, I think everybody here knows, over the last, you know, 12 months or so, the discussion on AIML has changed significantly you know, and is on pretty much everybody's radar. And um, so, so I think we, as a technical committee, maybe wanna, wanna see what we can do to help the community go, go beyond some of these purely technical questions and um, more discuss some of the bigger issues of how our technical committee can help, you know, define what is the craft of audio engineering as, you know, artificial intelligence becomes more prevalent. You know, what are professional and ethics related uh, questions to that end. And, and so our goal of this town hall is to really start a discussion um, with all of you to kind of answer some of those questions. And um, so let me just introduce real quickly our, uh, the facilitators of the town hall. Next slide. Uh, so, so there's myself, I'm Gordon, I'm a research scientist um, at Merle in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then we have Jonathan Weiner, our uh, you know, AES past president, recording engineer, and educator. I uh, worked with Jonathan at Isotope back in the day when we launched you know, Neutron into the world, which was an early machine learning related uh, product. And I'm, he was always, you know, had so many insightful and valuable things to share about that technology as we put it out there. And we're thrilled to have him as one of the facilitators of this event. And then we also have Keith up here. Um, Keith McElvain from Wave Sciences. He has a, a lot of experience in um, audio forensics and really deep technical issues and legally legal related things. And so he has also put together all these cool quotes you saw at the beginning. And so we're, we're very happy to have his perspective to help us facilitate. And then kind of the, the ringleader of all of us down here on the floor, Nissim Lefford, all the way from Sweden, and she doesn't want to be up on stage. She really wants this to be an interactive town hall for the people. And she's, she's down there with the microphone to try to, try to convince all of you to, to join the discussion with us. The word may have been proletariat. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah. But uh, so, so take it away, Nissen. Thank you so much. I am guilty of using the word proletariat. Um, so as, as Gordon said, uh, you know, our goal today is really to start a dialogue to understand better what your questions and concerns are uh, regarding AI. Um, and because this is, AI is, is sort of infiltrating audio in a, a number of ways, it's a really broad topic. And we're going to try to constrain the scope of the discussion for today as a starting place. This is just sort of event number one, we hope. Um, but to constrain the scope to creative production, um, and we can interpret that as we will. But you know, how is AI affecting us uh, as we work on um, sound design and music production and, and the sort of con creative component? Um, so what is a, a town hall? So 
This is not a panel discussion, despite the fact that we have a panel up here. Um, we're really hoping that you in the audience steer the dialogue today, um, that you'll, you'll bring forward, you'll, you'll tell us about some of your positive expectations for AI, as well as, understandably, your concerns. Um, today, we're, we're trying not to uh, get too uh, waylaid in, in a bunch of debates. We think today is, is mostly about understanding what you're thinking about um, and, and identifying the issues that we as a professional organization need to, and community need to investigate further. Um, so even within the narrower scope of creative audio production, um, this is still broad. So we've tried to uh, break this today's session into, into four areas or question blocks that can, can kind of serve as these conceptual umbrellas for us. Um, so uh, the question blocks are the creative application of AI, uh, issues related to ethics and law, uh, the development of AI tools, um, and, and the sort of technical application of AI, and uh, also what the AES can be doing to, to kind of help all of us adapt and embrace AI. Um, so that's the basic structure, and what we can do is dedicate uh, roughly 15 minutes to each of these question blocks. And to get us going for each of these question blocks, we've invited um, some, some experts to, to kind of uh, sort of start these discussions. Uh, hopefully they can inspire our thinking um, and, and get us talking about the issues. And then at the very end, we'll have a, a kind of summary of things that we've spoken about. So um, again, we want this to be really interactive. So uh, here's, here's how you can participate. Uh, our experts will open the question box and we invite you to come forward with your comments and your questions. We have a mic over there. Um, I will run around uh, and hand mics to people. Um, and we also have Slido. So you can uh, submit questions using your phone. Um, join us at Slido. There's the uh, event number over there. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll constantly look to Slido and incorporate those questions into these discussions. Uh, a, few, a few ground rules. Next slide. A few ground rules. Uh, please try to keep your comments short, uh, you know, 60 seconds or so, just so we can get a lot of ideas out today. Um, and let's try to remember that today's really for uh, learning about what we're thinking about, for identifying questions and concerns, um, and not so much debate. Um, so uh, in Slido, we've uh, enabled thumbs up. So you c if you agree or have the same question, please, please use a thumbs up. Uh, let's not use the thumbs down today. Let's just sort of collect all the positive uh, ideas and questions. Um, so that's the, the basic idea for today. And Slido will remain up for the next week. So if your question doesn't get asked today, uh, you can submit it and we will keep collecting those questions. Thank you. So uh, just a little bit more sort of uh, serving as an intro before we get into the question blocks. Um, um, we, sorry, am I missing a piece here? Oh, I think this is a little bit out of order. Okay. So be, I'm going to introduce our um, people who can speak from a position of some authority in the arena of these question blocks. And then I, um, I'll give a little bit more context or a little bit more of an intro. So um, we have uh, Andrew Sheps in the center here um, representing the creative perspective. Um, you can see his um, descriptors, if you will. Emily Tate, who works for Jones Day, who's been kind enough to join us. Uh, she flew in from Detroit today to represent the legal perspective. She's a patent attorney and Christian Steinmetz as a PhD researcher uh, to address the development perspective. And of course, Gordon is here really uh, to represent the perspective of the TCM MLAI and, and incorporate and listen to uh, the community's input and the discussion that takes place. So in, in the run up to this, we thought it would be interesting to do two things. One is uh, to curate some pre-reads. Uh, I don't know if anybody's had a chance to take a look, uh, but there's a link in the event description where you can go and find some interesting uh, articles and reports about um, that are related to the topic. And we also uh, implemented a survey. How many of you took part in the survey? 
Excellent. You all get extra credit. Um, how many, how many uh, people in the room uh, are currently working in, specifically in the arena of AI? Okay. So I don't know why you didn't take the survey, but that's your homework. Um, anyway, um, and how many of you are coming in with questions? I want more hands. I, I, more hands. So if, you, if you're not raising your hand yet, sometime in the next 10 minutes, I fully expect you to have a question. Um, at any rate, we, we mounted a survey to kind of take the temperature uh, um, of the attitudes that exist already within the community towards um, AI in, in the context of creative work. And we asked, oh, slides. Do you want me to? I want just, people were still trying to get oh, good. to my yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay, there we go. Um, so um, you can see the bullet points here. Um, the things that, these were the questions. We wanted to know who was taking the survey and a general sense of sentiment, uh, broadly speaking, and also in, in some very specific ways. And then we had a free text box where you could offer some uh, comments. And so we have the resulting statistics. Um, and it's interesting to just quickly take a look and see who's represented in the survey. It's largely, actually kind of our expected um, uh, people, I think, kind of represent AES members and membership. So we have kind of the largest components were music production and creatives, people in research and people involved in product development, and then um, education as well as a larger component. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so general sentiment, we, we, it seems to be pretty positive. It's not surprising. You all are here and, and are probably not technophobes, but, but people who are somewhat friendly to technology, so less likely to be reactive to uh, headlines uh, in, the, um, in the news uh, in a knee-jerk fashion and think of it's going to completely define your life. Um, the impact on creative potential, again, interestingly, fairly positive in the overall sentiment, at least neutral. Uh, if not favorable. Uh, and then um, comments about AI improving efficiency in your work. It's interesting to see that this was largely neutral. I, you know, be interesting to think what people take away from that um, statistic, if you will. Um, how often are people incorporating AI into their workflow? So they're optimistic and yet they're not using it a lot, is what this seems to indicate. Maybe it's early days. Um, and then in the free text field, uh, there are just a few comments that we pulled out. My favorite was, there are no shortcuts to the top of the coconut tree. If there's anybody here who submitted that comment uh, and you want to add some color, we would certainly invite you to, but um, take, take from that what you will. Um, but some of the comments that you see here, I think, represent some perspectives that we all might easily understand and might share um, in our own thinking. Um, and so we, I guess we can leave that, that um, the last slide up for just another moment so people can read it if they'd like. And um, at this point, I would like to turn the mic over to Andrew Sheps, who's going to lead us into the first question block. And again, this is the block that's meant to help surface questions, thoughts, ideas uh, within the arena of the work of the creative and represent uh, coming from the perspective of the creative work. Andrew. Uh, so I didn't do my homework, and that's why I'm stealing quotes from PJ Harvey and Brian Eno, and I only stole them about eight minutes ago. But I think they both speak to things that we should talk about. Um, one is PJ Harvey's assertion that you can't imagine the imperfection of a human touch will be outridden by the perfection of a computer. I think there are entire genres of music that prove that isn't true years ago and has nothing to do with AI, but I think there's a very important point to be made based on that. And then Brian Eno's quote is basically that every single tool that's made for creatives is made to be broken. And I've been at panels and it kind of I don't like the fact that this was the attitude, but with manufacturers saying, well, we're making this, but we're really interested to see how they break it. Like, well, that's cool, but why don't you ask us how we'd like to break it first? And we may not know exactly, but there should be a little more interaction there rather than we're just gonna build some stuff and then hope that it's used differently. Um, my main take on this though, and I wanna give two sides to it, is it's very Dickensian, is that it is the best of times and the worst of times for people making records. So the best of times part is that the AI tools, such as what Isotope has done, um, 
the spectral layers program from Steinberg. And then if you go diving on GitHub and you can do some of these Google collab things, the demixing side of the AI tools that have been made is extraordinary. And there are two reasons why that really matters. One is that for immersive mixing, you're revisiting things that may have been mixed years and years and years ago. And I don't know if anybody heard, but there was a major label where everything that they were storing caught fire. And it wasn't well cataloged in the first place. So when you go looking for source material to make new versions of old things, sometimes you cannot find that source material. Sometimes you find the wrong source material. So this can be very, very difficult. It's usually easier to find conglomerations of things like an instrumental mix of something or the stems from guitar band or something like that where you can get things that you could put together but to be creative with them you need to split them up but it's not just for immersive mixes I'm working on an album right now where probably 80% of the drums on the album whether it's machine or a live player have ended up being stereo just because that's been the creative process stuff getting passed back and forth so I have kick, snare, hat, and toms, all on one stereo track, but I would like to change the sound of the toms without affecting the kick drum. Just with EQ, that's almost, well, it's impossible to do. But I do a Google collab called DrumSep, and in about two minutes on shared GPU, I get a five-minute stereo track separated into kick, snare, cymbals, and toms. And this is a beat, which is a riding floor tom with a kick drum, and it's split as if they were tracked at different times. There is no bleed, it is perfect, there are no artifacts. It's magic. That can't be done with traditional tools. That has to be done with a gigantic machine learning model of here, and I didn't have to feed it anything. I just give it the thing. It's already been trained to the point where it worked a thousand percent perfectly and gives me raw material that I need to do what I want to do creatively. So that side of it, I couldn't be more excited about it. Um, ChatGPT really has nothing to do with that side of things, but obviously it is the poster boy for gigantic machine learning modules. But as the scope of what the software is supposed to do gets smaller, the less it matters that it can scrape the internet up to 2021. It doesn't matter. Drums have been recorded for a really long time, seed it, do it, and the tools are amazing. So that's incredible. Then there is the music generation, which I'm sure we'll get into quite a bit when we start talking about the legal side of these things, who owns what and the right to your own personality and style and all of that kind of thing. And my, I'm not going to talk about how it works or what I think, but what I think is this goes to the heart of PJ Harvey's quote, where it's very easy for creative people to say, yeah, but it's a human thing. And what's true about that is that from everything I have heard, the AI generated music that is based on styles or people's voices or something like that is, and not to be mean, I don't, are there any label people here? Okay, cool. So <laughs> it's exactly like the way that labels will chase a hit. There is something that is very, very popular. They try and figure out why was that thing popular, and they, they will copycat like crazy, hoping to ride the coattails of the thing that's popular. And a recent example is that song Despacito, which was huge, absolutely huge. It had, I believe it was a quattro. Mm -hmm. So it's a Cuban four-string instrument. It's not on a lot of pop songs. All of a sudden, every single pop song had a quattro on it because, yeah, that's why everybody liked it. So the examples I've heard are very much like that, and I think, to not to coin a phrase at all, but there will be a difference with the creative generation between artificial intelligence and artificial creativity because the creativity is the thing that's only inside one person's head or the mistake or the things that AI is not supposed to do based on its model. So I'll shut up. There's a part of me that wishes you wouldn't. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so channeling Nissen, now's your time. So what we, at this point, we want to use everything that you've been thinking about and some of the things that you've heard from Andrew as uh, to stimulate your thoughts, your questions, um, and maybe I'll, I can sort of model this. Remember, this came from you all, 
This is not coming from us. So this is your first thing to throw into the air. We're not necessarily going to try to answer the questions, but these are the questions that we're throwing to the community that we think, or that you think, should be thought about. Uh, so there's one question here that says, there are data poisoning tools like Nightshade that corrupt image training models, ostensibly to protect IP. Might similar methods be developed for audio? It's an interesting question. And I actually kind of refer that to the, C the TC. But I'm going to pause here for a moment. And you can either approach the mic or you can raise your hand. You raise your hand, I have a, a mic I can. Hi, um, that was my question. But I guess I, I actually just read about this the other day and it was, I found it very interesting. And I guess what, primarily what they're doing is they're, they're shifting colors and gamma and little bits on, on you know, individual pixels that from a perceptual standpoint, a human doesn't detect. But when fed, you know, you feed a few of these images into a training model, all of a sudden something, all of a sudden something you say, hey, you know, give me a picture of a cat and it spits out a cow. Um, and so I started thinking, oh, could there be, you know, some sort of sub-audible watermarking or something like that that could, you know, similarly, if, if fed into a training algorithm, okay, now it's, you know, just going to give it a, a garbled signal that, but from, a, from an audible perspective, it still sounds like the music that we know and love. Yeah, I, can I just follow up on that? Because I, I find these things super exciting, and I think there's another tool in addition to Nightshade called Gloss, I think, which was co-developed actually between a bunch of like visual artists who were angry about you know their work being used in these generative AI models and they worked with academics from the University of Chicago and made a model to do similar things. One concern I have from the technical side about anything related to, to watermarking or, or even these tools is as hard as everybody's trying to develop, there's gonna be as many people trying just as hard to uh, defeat them and, and um, you know, I think there was a big article in Wired not that long ago saying that, uh, you know, within a couple of days, some computer security researchers beat all the best uh, AI watermarks that existed. And um, so I don't know. I think I think watermarking is is nice and could be a first level defense, but I don't think it will be sufficient in and of itself. But I, I don't know if any what uh, anyone else thinks on that side. I'd also just add that audio watermarking has been the holy grail of sort of security for audio products before they are released and it has always been terrible and there's never been one that's worked. I mean, there was one that was supposed to be a notch filter in the mid-range. <laughs> like that's not gonna sound good as it turns out. So I think that audio is, is strangely more perceptible with every sort of watermarking technique that they've tried as opposed to the visual stuff. So anyway. Well, my thought regarding that is, wouldn't it be better to spend time working on uh, deep learning models or ML models that can recognize material and where it's from versus trying to hide everything behind a wall. I, I actually love that idea. Like transparency is, yeah, maybe the, the key, right? Like, but again, I think music puts it in a different realm of what's the IP? The IP is the thought or the idea for a thing that just happens to be the chord progression or the melody or the lyric or whatever it is. So it's very hard to take the IP away from the music and say, well, okay, cool, check out the music, but that bit's mine. And so I think that's, what, that's the knee-jerk reaction. I agree with you that if you're gonna bother trying to make tools and use the technology, that technologically that's exactly what you should do. Get good things to train it on as opposed to give it a biased data set or something like that, which just gives you bad outcomes. I guess my question is, what's the difference between a machine copying someone's work as inspiration versus a human copying someone's work as inspiration? Intent? That's a great question. Let's pretend. I, I mean, the... And again, this is knee-jerk stuff, because you're trying very desperately to not only define it, but also to protect your own worth. Yeah. Because if you can easily be copied, then that means you've got nothing going on that's individual. So you always assume that can't be copied, and then that goes back to the Despacito 
argument, which to me moots the worry. Because it doesn't matter how many Despacitos you crank out from a model, they're all going to be knockoffs of Despacito. They're not going to be the next big thing. Because these models, on purpose, they don't make mistakes. They'll hunt around and they'll give you a different one each time. But it's all within a very small world and it's not going to jump outside of it. I, I think there's kind of an interesting nugget in there, though, if we think about some of the lawsuits recently, right, whether it's the Ed Sheeran stuff or Marvin Gaye estate or whatever. I mean, if, if, an, if an, uh, an ML learning uh, algorithm can say, hey, here's an idea that I've come up with, and by the way, here are the things that I've borrowed from, and that gives the creators a way to maybe get ahead of that and get the licensing that they need to, is it possible for the, the, something like ChatGPT to give you references as to where it decided to pull stuff that time? I mean, I think it's, it's all too many layers removed, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. I, I think right now it, it's not really possible, but it's not, it's, there's nothing stopping it from being possible. So it, in theory, we could eventually have that. Um, but I think to build on this point, when I look at the question that you asked, I, I think the difference fundamentally between like maybe this traditional idea of human, human, human creative versus human machine creative is about scale. And that's where the kind of imbalance is because these machine learning models can operate at a scale and proportion far beyond any human or even sometimes groups of humans, right? Because you can have systems that like basically ChatGPT has uh, taken in more data than any human could ever hope to observe in their entire lifetime. And it's compressed that information and I think a lot of the power of ChatGPT comes from that reality. So there's even this idea that ChatGPT might have ways of connecting information that's different than any human has been able to because of the breadth of information it's exposed to. So I think in the context of music, there's something similar there as well because these systems could, in theory, listen to the entire catalog of Spotify, whereas a human could listen all day their entire life and not even listen to a fraction of it. So there's definitely some sort of fundamental difference to me between what that kind of system is doing in a human. And I think when it comes to like deciding how we use these tools, that's an important thing to consider. I think I'm just going to say out loud, we have a couple of minutes left for this block before we move into the next arena. And we don't have to follow this you know, completely literally, um, but I'm just being the, the timekeeper here. You know, when, the thing that came to mind when I was listening to Andrew was that uh, it seems very exciting that there are these capabilities, but it's sounding like you have to be very informed about specific things that many creators may not be aware of. So I'm wondering whether some of the things that can be done, one of the things that can be done is to uh, share information on the ways that these various tools can be done. So for instance, you found out, I don't know how you found out, Andrew, that it was possible to split the drums into, uh, you know, separate them, but many people don't know right now that it's possible. So I think sharing that knowledge and making the tools, maybe making tools that make that more democratized would be uh, helping well, out. I mean, that's the difference between DrumSep and Spectral Layers. The Spectral Layers is a software platform. You pay some money, you have it. It has some stuff that it can do. But if you want to go more in depth, I don't think it's a problem to say you need to know more to do it. And then if something is very successful as a Google Collab, then that will turn into, it'll be monetized or it's open source and should stay open source. And there's been a, a thing which is not necessarily a good thing in the entire music industry forever is hiding the secrets and this person's got this secret sauce. And I don't think it's a bad thing that you should have to go pursue the knowledge yourself a little bit, but I agree that the stuff that's good should be turned into products and that are available, not because you can make lots of money on them, but to make them available and make them easier to use than having to be a geek like me who will go diving through GitHub looking for stuff. But I think that's just a matter of time. If it works, like Isotope jumps on things, people are going to jump on stuff. The one thing I might add as a kind of concern or corollary to that is um, like the, you know, the, if, if, I, th this question of it needs to work well at the thing we're trying to get it to do in order for it to have that kind of exponential reach and then blow up. Um, you know, my first reaction to hearing you say, oh, it can separate out the things is like, let's feed beatboxing to it, right? Or these things that like don't have necessarily, or like, you know, operatic singing or, you know, 
tree noises or whatever, right? And um, all of those sorts of kind of playful explorations, I feel like you get a, lar a much wider berth of that when you have people who kind of don't know what they're doing and are just playing around. And so I worry if, you know, if we do require, well, you know, you need to actually know quite a bit in order to get in, then, you know, we lose a lot of that exploration of like, oh, actually, this is so magical when applied to random thing nobody ever thought of. That's the Brian Eno quote. I mean, that is it, that, that we will break it. And that's, that's the creative part as well, is that we will use it wrong. And I've already done that a bunch. And most of the time it's terrible, but you get one good thing out of a hundred where you put a piano through a drum separation algorithm. It's weird <laughs> and it's kind of cool. So yeah, absolutely. And the tools will always be made to be used wrong in a creative setting. But at some point, you can't expect people to learn how to go through GitHub, so the stuff needs to be more accessible. But then, you know, maybe you should be a geek. <laughs> Great. All right, so let's, um, let's move on to question block number two. Uh, and uh, so this will be teed up for us by Emily Tate. And Emily, I think I'd be happy to just turn it over to you, and you yeah, can perfect. introduce your bullets. And uh, perfect. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Um, I'm Emily, and I am really happy to be here. Um, Jonathan's introduction indicated I would be talking from the legal perspective, which is true, but I'm speaking from my legal perspective, and all of the perspectives right now on the law on this topic are um, quite uncertain, as I'm sure you can all appreciate. So um, just a couple of things I wanted to comment on, and some of the questions that we've, we've had have have really illustrated some of the really fundamental legal issues, which we can talk about. But as I sort of look at this issue of AI and copyright, and in particular in the audio context, it's like, number one, you have to start with the reality that the law just moves so much slower than technology and moves so much slower than creativity. It's, it's part of the reason I became an IP tech lawyer, you know, to, to still get exposed to all these really cool um, creative things that people do. But the law just moves really, really slow. So we don't have a body of law yet that is established on artificial intelligence and IP. That body of law is going to be developed. And there's many lawsuits, as some of you already know, um, pending in this space of what AI and generative AI specifically means to creators and others. Um, the second piece that I wanted to just sort of flag as a starting point is thinking about the constitutional <coughs> underpinning of IP rights. You know, there's the copyright clause in the US Constitution, and it's simple, it, you know, to, to promote progress in science and the useful arts, you know, you're going to give inventors and authors a limited period of exclusivity for their inventions and their works of authorship. And so the whole idea is this bargain for exchange of how do we encourage innovation and reward innovators for a limited period of time. Um, we don't want this to go on forever. We know that copying at some point is something we want to encourage. That's how we grow as a society. So the idea is we give it to authors and inventors, some sort of exclusivity for some sort of limited period of time. And of course, that constitutional underpinning then leads to our body of statutory law governing IP. And I'm just pointing this out. I think it's important to bear that in mind because that th threshold question of how do you properly promote innovation and how do you pro appropriately protect inventors and creators is at the heart of this. And it also illustrates that our constitution and our statutory law just really wasn't ready for this, as I'm sure you can imagine all of our laws speak to human beings. And so the US Copyright Office has definitively said, you know, human authorship requirement, you cannot have an AI system be an, an inventor under US copyright law. But the Copyright Office and the courts that have interpreted this have acknowledged sort of the devil is in the details. And the Copyright Office is actually solicited and is in a period right now where we're soliciting comments from the public, all sorts of stakeholders on what about this? What about this? As it relates to AI specifically, right? We know that you can't have an AI tool be an author, but what, what level of human participation is necessary? And do different industries have different considerations that are relevant here? And all sorts of questions that are really foundational. And the Copyright Office is grappling with these things. The courts are grappling with these things. I mean, really foundational questions. Um, and then the third thing I just wanted to flag is sort of a I think just conversation starter is this idea of 
AI is one of the only topics that as a lawyer, everybody has an opinion about, meaning I can talk to my husband, I can talk to my sister, my stepdaughter, my, most people have a knee-jerk reaction. And sometimes that's informed by their experience, their generation, you know, they think it's crazy, they think it's scary, other people far more receptive to it. Really, really a topic that I think, number one is interesting to most, but number two, you can have radically different views of the world. Um, on this subject. And layered on top of that, in the context of copyright law, what constitutes fair use? Some of you might be familiar that the, the Supreme Court ruled in this uh, Andy Warhol case this summer on an issue of fair use. We can talk about that if it's of interest. But there you had a majority decision authored by Justice Sotomayor and a dissenting opinion authored by Justice Kagan. These are two justices who are often very much aligned in their views and their judicial philosophies, but in this decision had completely different views of the world on this threshold question of fair use. And the procedural history that led up to that case illustrated huge divergence too, because you had the Southern District of New York siding with the Warhol Foundation and then the Second Circuit reversing. So lots of intelligent people who are schooled in the law having completely different view of how the law is to apply to the facts. And that just adds another complicating factor. So with that, I just wanted to tee those sort of things up conceptually and, I mean, certainly invite any questions or comments. Uh, I, uh, keeping in mind that we have an international membership and an international audience here, um, and also that, you know, the, the, the question of borders as it relates to developing tools and the data sets that are used to inform the tools will often span nationalities and legal systems and, and values. Um, I think there's a question there which is like, well, how do you deal with that? But, um, and I'm not sure if that can be answered, but it, it, it certainly comes up for me. Yeah, I mean, it certainly does. And I think, I mean, in addition to the creative content that could be generated in whole or in part by AI, there's also the creative processes that underlie the technology itself, the coding that goes into that, and that often straddles borders. And so, yeah, it's an incredibly complex um, question that I think it's very fact specific in each case and how to grapple with it, how to protect IP, how to enforce it, who has the rights. Um, very fact dependent and quite uncertain at this point. So now to you all. There's a hand in the back. Is that? No, that, it's not just. And a reminder that Slido is still open. We're looking okay. at it, so we're looking at you. So I, I attended the US Copyright Office meeting on AI and music a few months ago. And it seemed that the conclusion was that as long as the, the, the output of the model is not replacing or has a purpose to take away basically money from the people that are creating the data, it should be okay. So I'm looking for a very clear yes or no answer. Is it okay, for example, for the drum model that, that we just talked about to use drum music just because it's just a separating algorithm? Is a very clear, people, we're discussing a lot like, yeah, for use for things that might replace, but what about the ones that clearly the model will not replace the, 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 the drummer? The drummer. We're, we're training an algorithm that is just splitting drum, drums. But of course, that required tons of data stored in, a, in, a, in, a, in, an office, in servers of an office of a commercial entity in the law. Is that OK? So I cannot give you what you want, which is a clear yes or no answer, unfortunately. But I, I will say, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're sort of envisioning a scenario where you have a Gen AI tool that can sort of simulate the sound of a drum as sort no, of a... The, the one that we just talked about, splitting the drums into different things. Okay. The data used for that was drummers playing uh, and isolated tracks or something like that. So the, the, the output of the model is never to replace a drummer. It's just to separate tracks. Is it okay for commercial entities to scrape data online, put it on a server, train their model, sell it and still use data that might have been copyrighted. The scenario you described certainly would have facts in it that lean towards more of a fair use type of argument. 
I think that the pro there's there's two things there though that are pretty big things, right? So there's a lot of pending litigation right now that's dealing with this issue of data scraping. Um, and these lawsuits are pending right now, um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, involving prominent authors, comedians, um, and, and uh, also in the visual arts, Getty Images, as well as um, recently a lawsuit um, against uh, Anthropic on musical lyrics, okay? And these lawsuits are all different. They have some commonalities for sure, but they're all different uh, factually and in terms of the tools they're being used and the way that fundamentally how the, the tools are using the data, right? But at a high level, they involve like data scraping. And I think the issue is like, what is the nature of the scraping? And what, you know, data scraping is the new sort of buzzword, but is the scraping, right? On the plaintiff side, the argument's gonna be, well, data scraping is just a clever way of saying copying my original content. And you know, the, on the defendant side, it's gonna be like, well, no, 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 that's not true. We didn't copy your work in part. You know, the algorithm was built this way and it uses the data and how is that use any different than someone who might be inspired by something and, you know, and that's allowed, right? So I think the devil will be in the details of how that is in fact happening, right? And then there's lots of questions in terms of how original is the underlying data? Because you can scrape data if, it, if the underlying content is not copyrighted or otherwise protected, right? Then there's issues, you know, on that threshold question as well. So I think, but certainly, you know, the scenario you described presents probably less on its face a copyright concern on other sort of scenarios you can imagine. Um, but it's interesting because I think that's sort of on the input side of things as to whether or not the input and then the processing of the data, whether that would constitute an infringement or whether it would not, and whether if it does constitute infringement, is there a fair use argument that would negate that? Then there's the other piece of it, which is the output, right? And there's a lot of questions right now of, okay, even if I'm good on this, I'm not stepping on anyone's rights, do I own the output? Like, can I claim proprietary ownership over that and what level of human involvement do I need to establish, you know, to convince the copyright office or the courts or whoever that I participated enough as a human being to claim sort of that I meet the human authorship requirement. So there's sort of this like input piece and the output piece, and I think both of those areas are uncertain right now. We have a couple of minutes left in this block before we move on to the next. Hi. Um there was an informative panel on this topic, specifically on the legal issues yesterday as well. And um, some of the panelists were sharing tips for doing business in this kind of volatile time while the law hasn't quite caught up. And I'm curious, Emily, if you have your own best practices or if you could share a little bit about how, at a general, in a general sense, how you're advising your clients right now um, an example that was shared yesterday, pretty basic one, but always a good reminder is just to have extremely transparent contracts um, around anything in, you know, involving data. And I'm just, yeah, wondering if you could speak to that and share a little bit about how you're coaching your clients on this. Yeah, and we've, we've gotten a lot of questions on this. I think, you know, since ChatGPT launched it, or approaching the one year anniversary, right, suddenly clients that really didn't view themselves as tech companies or companies that were dealing with AI. Suddenly, they all had to think about it because most of them have workforces and their employees are gonna be using these tools. So again, kind of going back to the input and output you know, issue that I was just describing, you know, the, on the input side, depending on the type of company, right, you have to ask yourself, like, what, is, what am I concerned about inputting here or my employees, contractors inputting? So if you're a software company, you may have some concerns about proprietary code, trade secret, et cetera. If you have clients, um, third parties that you work with, that piece of sort of just making sure that your own data and theirs is being appropriately protected is a key consideration. And I think in terms of using these tools, it's very dependent on the tool and the version of the tool and whether you're using something that's specific to your enterprise or a publicly available um, tool. But there's terms and conditions and some terms and conditions say whatever you input might be used as training data, could be seen by human beings, things like that. So if you have something that's proprietary to yourself or a third party, that, that can be a real problem. So I, certainly a high level thing is, you know, know the tool that you're using and, and really figure out like, what is your key input going to be, right? Certain types of uses are less likely to raise really significant concerns, right? Um, 
sometimes people use like marketing materials and things like that being less of a concern, although obviously you could risk, there are risks associated with that as well. Um, and then I think just like on the output side, knowing like what are your, what is your intended use of whatever it is, right? The, and, and do you want to take an approach of with your personnel kind of getting out in front of it and saying, we know you're going to use it and we want to provide some guidelines and these will evolve to make sure we're using these tools legally and ethically and that kind of thing. But I think all of those considerations really come down to, you know, the specific organization at use, how many employees do you have, you know, because where are those, you know, to, to Jonathan's point, geographically, right? It, the, the more dispersed you are, you have more risk, you have different really values, I mean, also laws, but values that inform this whole notion of what is IP, what is mine. So I think all those things need to be um, considered. And then in terms of, you know, also, we've certainly seen clients who have, you know, concerns about this, how do I establish that I have, you know, that I, human, that a human's involved. And so, you know, having some type of documentation of the human involvement in that output um, and sort of tracking, auditing that can be also an important consideration. I, I would like to just surface something that I think is related to this and, and um, spans, I think, all, all of the question blocks. But we have a real issue around getting good data uh, that, has, that relates to IP concerns and IP considerations. And most, if not all, ethical developers are either generating their own data, which may or may not be the highest quality data, especially in the context of creative use, um, or, um, uh, and, and or they're compensating the contributors, which becomes very expensive very quickly. Uh, so there are a number of ways in which getting good data sets gets very expensive, but I think one of the things that the AES might be well suited to do is to investigate best practices around data collection, data compensation, um, and how to think about how good the data needs to be in order to drive the development of the tool that you're trying to create, and thinking about the context for the tool. So um, that sort of falls out of, of some of what you're describing for me as well. Um, okay, so again, we're not, uh, I, I think a lot of the discussion points will span all the question blocks, but let's move now over to the development perspective and research. Uh, so, Christian, please. Sure. So, I can say just a few words here to maybe start some discussion. Um, my questions here actually try to span all the three topics, but from my perspective as someone, as a researcher working in AI. Um, I think the first question is very much a technical one and one that also looks at kind of the user, as, as you know, how we think about the user maybe from the research perspective. Um, what's, what's something that we've seen kind of in adjacent creative domains like vision, for example, uh, image generation. Um, there's just kind of been this idea of like, oh, well, we can type in a text prop and generate an image. Why not do that for audio, essentially? So a lot of those models we've seen now are just a copy-paste of what's been done uh, in those other domains. And so looking at that from a researcher that kind of comes from the perspective of audio, I actually wonder, like, is that actually the best kind of tool that would suit creators and what would actually be best for creators that we could build um, from an AI perspective? And so I think people here in the audience might have thoughts on, on that and what might be interesting. Um, and I think the other thing that was raised before that I'd like to uh, point out again is maybe there should be some discussion about the role of open source uh, in, in audio because, as Andrew mentioned, like kind of the secret sauce DSP has kind of been a traditional uh, trend in music production software. But the advancements we've seen uh, in AI, particularly again in image generation, have been driven by the open source community. Um, and in some sense, you could make a claim that maybe the slower movement uh, in music tech space with AI has been due to the fact that it's more closed and not as open as a, of a community. Because it's, it's really quite incredible to look at the advancements that have come about uh, in the image domain where the contributors are Give, which there's a huge collaboration between both industry and academia and independent open source collaborators. And without that, we would not be seeing the same explosion of AI today. So I would really love to see more of that um, in the audio and particularly music tech space. But it's still unclear with how the business is set up now, how that can actually be feasible. And maybe people here have thoughts um, on how that might work from a business perspective. Please feel free. A uh, couple of things. Slido is still open. <laughs> and also, there is another mic over there, so we can use both. 
I feel like I'm talking a lot. I don't want to dominate things, but um, I, I think the, the perspective that I keep coming back to um, it, on this topic is that it feels like a lot of what the um, AI tools that have come about so far, whether it's an image processing or music or what have you, have aimed to do is to replace something that humans do, and namely something that humans enjoy doing. Right? We, we, we make music, we make art because we love it. It nurtures our soul. It, it's a creative outlet. It lifts us up. Um, and that to me feels like a strange perspective. And I don't know if it's that it's kind of low hanging fruit or, or, or what. I, I would fully embrace AI tools that could help me do the tedious and mundane and, you know, things that, that, I, you know, don't bring me any great joy. If they can let me spend more time getting to know my favorite compressors and EQs and, and you know, getting the best out of a song. I come from a mastering perspective, right? But, um, you know, if, if it's just something that's trying to emulate mastering, whether that's my specific style or a generic style or what, that's not that interesting. But if, but if it can take my, you know, my intake forms and set up sessions for me, and you know, do some of that, that work. Now, okay, is that taking work away from someone that might be my assistant? I don't know, there's ethical questions there too, I guess. It's, the, the rabbit hole goes deep. But that's, that, that's the thing that I keep coming back to, is I would love to see tools that are more assistive rather than taking over you know, something that we love. I do feel inspired to respond to that from the perspective of the educator. Um, uh, whether it's educator in a formal context or educating people who are simply trying to realize some, some goals. And I think there's enormous potential. So I, it's not uncommon to see creatives who are somewhat lost in the forest and, and they don't know which way to turn. And, and in that context, and that, that, this could be somebody who's quite advanced or somebody who's actually at the beginning of the journey. Um, and I think in that context, it does have potential to be illuminating. So I think there's sort of a, an in-between application between the two sort of two polar views that you advanced. Um, so um, please, um, yeah, there's a hand raised here for a mic, but we have somebody here first and then Jean-Marc and I'm then... I'm going to be able to give it back because the, when I was hearing the previous person, uh, I was thinking, is it as simple as saying we're going to use the AI tools to um, simplify the part of the job that we don't like doing, that is uh, essentially taking away from the creativity. Is it too simple or is there, uh, mm -hmm. should we sh consider this at a deeper level than just saying, there's the stuff I don't like to do, I want AI to do that for me and I want to keep the creative part just for myself. So I'll speak to that because I've spent the last two and a half years writing software that does exactly that. I think that workflow automation is actually the worst place for AI ever because then it will be thinking and it will not do it the way you want to do it. The vagaries need to be set up in the process, but then you really are just doing workflow automation. So to your point exactly, I've written software that bounces mixes because if I mix a 12 song record, with the mix versions and then the stems I need to make, that's usually somewhere between 250 and 300 mix passes. If I have to print those myself, I will make mistakes, it'll be a problem, but I can set those up myself relatively quickly and then they bounce all night while I'm asleep. But that is purely workflow automation. I need to be the one to say like, hey, on this song, let's do this, on this song, let's do this. So that's really, I think, outside of this space, but with the drum separation model, that is, I have a creative idea of something I want to do with the drums. If I cannot split them up, it will take me forever and I won't get there. I can spend five minutes and split them up and now I can stay creative and do that. So I think it is, that's the space where the AI models will really, really help us. But I think the workflow stuff, it can be automated and everybody does things different enough that you need to have control over that. And I don't think I would want it trying to think about how I'd want to do those things. Um, responding to some of the questions that were kind of uh, launched over here, uh, and, um, you know, one of the things that I think, or that I've been thinking about a lot, is that this question of um, what do I want to do versus where does the AI come in, to me, always seems to end like right where, 
like right where my interest in ends is where the AI should pick up, right? Like you know, and that uh, currently that feels like a very general thing where um, where sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of AI tools I feel like currently feel very general. It's like make the entire piece of music or master the whole thing. Um, and I'm I, I think I would personally be really interested in seeing much more specific AI applications, kind of like within the general of like, oh well, actually I play guitar and piano, uh, so I'm gonna you know do those bits. But I would love to you know. You know, please make me the the thing that makes just the drums for it, and then I actually really like mastering some little bits, but I don't like mastering the other bits. So like, let AI and and so like some some kind of more specific thing with that would I think be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I could say just a quick thing about that. I I think I mean in our research we kind of totally agree with that perspective, and a lot of the stuff that we're working on in our group is about integrating AI more closely with the existing tools that exist. So DAW, audio effects. So right there's, you could kind of push it into these two paradigms of like a lot of these like text to audio models, like you're saying, like they generate you a whole song after you press a button or type a text prompt. And everything that's happening kind of inside of that as far as like how is it synthesizing, how is it making those creative decisions are hidden from you and outside your control beyond this like one prompt that you're able to put in. And I think on the other side, what we're interested in is saying, can we actually let the AI operate at the same kind of interface that a human operates, which would let you have the ability to, for example, go in and edit any part of that master that it made, or perhaps you know, override certain decisions, but you'd have this kind of grounding in tools that you as a human and producer already understand. And so in my mind, that's what I'm kind of most excited about in this space. And Logic has the virtual drumming, which I believe started out algorithmically, not necessarily trying to be smart, but I would be shocked if they are not already employing more AI generated tools to have it be more interesting, whatever, but those are also editable. So it's exactly what you're you're talking about and what you're talking about only doing part of the job. Okay, so um, one other thing that I was thinking about referring back to the title of the discussion, basically how the forum or the audience of basically the AI committee would be like in the future for this discussion. Um, one bucket of discussion that we're having right now so far is mainly around the creative side of things, the impact of the audio and AI for the creators, for the artists, and how it would basically help optimize the workflows and practices that help create a better art craft in the end. But I think we are also living in a time where the buckets of AI and audio are growing beyond that as well. And it will be interesting for me to see that discussion also happening. The other bucket that I was thinking about is basically AI having this strong presence as a baseline for all the research and development that we've been doing over the past few years. So referring to the, some of the panels that we've had, we've had discussions around HRTF optimizations, how AI is now playing a strong role potentially in the future to help creating more um, realistic experience for the special audio side of things. But this is something that is happening less at the creative side or artist side, it's more of a research and development side of things. And then there's a third bucket that I was thinking is more from the mass consumer side of things. I think we are now living in a golden age where you know, as AI is getting more generative and as the devices are getting more intelligent, inevitably we expect as humans to interact with them in an auditory way, right? So we expect to talk to them and we expect them to talk back to us. And referring to the topic of basically here, we are as audio, audiophiles, basically, this is where then we're going to have a lot of areas in which we can talk about how voice and generative voice is going to be a big part of that as well. How we can use the models, the generative AI models, like Whisper and all that, to trans have real-time translation capabilities uh, and also text-to-speech capabilities, voice synthesis capabilities. And in the end, how these three buckets kind of all tied to each other to create this bigger story of basically AI and audio and voice that impacts all these three buckets of consumer, research and development, and also the artist and creative, right? Thank you. Uh, just to restate, I don't know if you are here at the beginning, we, th this is intended to be the uh, first discussion uh, framed primarily around creative work. Um, and totally agree with you that there are many other domains and applications um, that need to be explored. Um, I, I think to your last point, it's, it's very interesting, and Andrew, I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments about this, but when you think about the, the interactivity of the presentation of something that's been curated as a, uh, a work of art or music or whatever you want to call it, 
um, I mean, we've seen examples where there are dynamic playback engines that are available in gaming, it makes a lot of sense. For music, maybe people are more in a pa passive sort of scenario. I, I don't know what the appetite might be going forward to, to talk back to you know, Olivia Rodrigo, uh, why she's singing to me and change something about what I'm hearing. It's well, here, here's the extension of that. Yes. So you have recommendation engines on all music services, right? So you decide, I want to play a record or I've got a playlist and that ends and it recommends some stuff. At what point will consumers want to have a, just a generated music experience as opposed to a playlist because they can train it themselves and eventually it will always be something that they like. Done. And that I just occurred to me and it's quite scary but I actually think that that's, I'd be shocked if there isn't an app that does that in the next year. In fact, I'm going to patent that immediately. <laughs> There, you're, you're there is eight. research in this <laughs> area. I think this leads to the question of production value. You know, uh, DJs like to DJ. Uh, well, I think some of the value that people get when they listen to somebody DJing is the, the content that went into it has very high production value from the get-go. Whereas if it's created from scratch, maybe it won't have this human element that brings the... But it, it's value. what listeners want to hear. There's some people who will absolutely agree with the P.J. Harvey quote, where that's what they want, and they want the connection to the artist themselves. And Olivia Rodrigo, that's exactly what they want. There are people who identify with her, and it empowers them. And there are other people who just want a jam. And they don't want that jam to end and have something come in that they don't like as much. So that jam can now be infinitely extended in interesting ways. There, you know, who's going to make a party playlist? If no one's really listening anyway, you just want to make sure the tempo's cool and, yeah. you know, it's... Word infinity scares me. Yeah. <laughs> this is sort of a legal angle, but if you generate all your data, let's say you're an established artist and you have a large back catalog, and then you develop your own ML model to now create new music based only on the training of your data, is that considered an AI-created artifact, or is that your artifact because you're in control of, A, the AI, but also the data that was fed into it you created? Right, so, I mean, that kind of goes back to the, the devil in the details, right, for each fact pattern, and I feel like all of these pack, fact patterns will kind of play out in litigation. There's no easy answer to that. If you're the artist, you're gonna say, I had human involvement there. It's all of my underlying works, and then I created a system that would pull out thing, you know, pull out you know new content based on my existing content. I'm the original copyright o owner, which means that I have the right to make a derivative work, and that's exactly what I did here. And I had a, I, I was involved in that process, and I then, you know, the, the machine learning, you know, did its thing, and then I applied human intelligence to craft new work based on my own existing um, content. You know, and the other side of the argument would be, well, wait a second. You know, you'd have to get, you'd have to parse out the, okay, well, but human authorship as to this new work, you, it was a Gen AI tool doing it, not you. And so you tapped out of your creative process, and a machine really did it based on yes, your data. But that doesn't mean that you have a copyright going forward. So I think those are kind of the disputes that I mean we're likely to see, and it's an interesting scenario where you have again this very old body of law and judges who are not technologists, who are not creatives, um, and you know, ultimately they and a lay jury could decide these disputes and create precedent. Um, but I do think that all these you know, good lawyers know how to, to lawyer and make arguments, and because most of these scenarios will involve like really intensive facts, I think that while we might get some pearls from our case law, certainly, they're, you know, there's going to be a lot of room to make arguments on both sides of it because of the just inherently fact-specific nature of what's going to be going on in each of these cases. It's, um, you know, if you think about it, even like with, uh, there was a question earlier about, I think you asked it about, you know, machine being inspired to copy versus a human being inspired. And it occurred to me, you know, the word inspire, we usually think of that as like a human emotion, you're inspired to do something. And it kind of goes back to that question in the Constitution, like when, when do you inspire someone or something to do something? Does a machine need to be inspired to do something or is it just executing on a command? Is that, you know, really inspiration? But I think also that question of copying is also like one that has a lot of minefields in it. Like you could, you know, there's cases in copyright law where it's like, 
obviously like there is some sort of subjective judgment as to what is truly creative versus something that's a compilation of facts. And there's been litigation on this. There's old litigation on somebody who wanted to have a copyright and a phone book. Okay, yes, you, you can, right? But that's gonna inherently be thinner than a copyright in a beautiful original painting. Um, because it's a compilation of facts and you can't have exclusive ownership over alphabetizing names and listing phone numbers. And so what do you have if you don't have that in your phone book? Um, so I think like those questions of like the nature of the copying and what is the work and all of those things. Um, and then you would raise something also about this option of inspiration versus copying and I think that's also a key gray area, right? Because we can be inspired by so many things. Like we've been inspired by our entire life experience to inform what we might draw, paint, create musically. And then there's the issue of attribution. When does something cross the line from inspiration to the content has been copied, right? And that, that's also a really big fact-specific inquiry. And there are already companies buying the right to the output of artists to train stuff, like the deep fake vocals that can be generated. That is now a commodity that is being, it's like when they started buying up writers' shares of catalogs, it's, and it's already happening. So even though it's not defined yet, there are people buying the right to have that be what trains the model. So we're, we're now moving into the last open free block, either you know, responses to things that you've heard, wholly new topics that haven't even been discussed. Slido is still open and I, I'll turn it over to Gordon. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, sorry, comment a couple things that have bubbled up on Slido that maybe we can use to kind of kick off this final section. And I think some of them we touched on, but the, what got the most upvotes is um, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that this is the thing that people are most interested in discussing. How do you see AI aiding in music creation and production in the next five to 10 years? Go. Can we get to Andrew's uh, vision of, uh, you know, oh, sure. <laughs> gener Great. generative music instead of playlists in five well, to so ten years? Take notes, uh, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. What, what are the steps? Notes. Well, it, other than the thing I've already patented on my phone, <laughs> there's an app for that. I, I mean, I think it's just going to be the extension of the tools we have now as well because the application will start to spread. The demixing will become more user-friendly and more available to people. And that can be used in very creative ways and also in very illegal and destructive ways. So there is that. Um, but that is a tool that will absolutely be getting used because just for archival and making new product from existing product and immersive mixes is one gigantic example of that, but it won't be the last and there'll be new formats. So to be able to manipulate your source material to allow you to do other things with it, I think, and that's been going on since Neutron and, and the rest of it. That's huge. I think that the fact that I was talking about someone being able to generate their own playlist of music because it isn't even a playlist anymore and the music is being generated, it's sad and maybe it sounds a little sad, but I think there are quite a few people who would be absolutely fine with that. And I think that perhaps there is a small part of the music industry that will get carved out of it because that's what they're generating at the moment is derivative works within a genre to help fill up playlists for people who just want more than six hours of their favorite artists, so it's sound alikes and things like that. What will be very interesting to me is to see how the labels and things like labels respond to this. Are they gonna wanna generate their own mixes? Because in terms of generating immersive mixes, they already are wishing that they could just up mix their stereo mixes because then they got no problems, they don't need approval and they're done. And then when that doesn't really work out because Apple says we will not accept up mix stereo because that's not an immersive mix, that's up mix stereo, then they will see if they can do it in house because the economics of it all is what will drive this and economically it might be easier to mix and master online or with a tool that they build than it is to get humans to do it because humans who are good at a creative thing can be expensive or not, but you have to find them and they need to do it and it's hit or miss. 
Um, yeah, I wanted to add like a comment um, to what might change. I, I feel like that it will be way easier for entry-level user to create music, and I think there's also a lot of demand. I mean, if you look at the karaoke market in, in China or something, there are a lot of people who actually want to make music, but they it's co too complicated to, do, to use a DAW. And I think what I feel is interesting is what will be the difference between the pros and these people who are finally kind of able to produce their own music to a certain quality level, probably not at the highest level, but maybe still enough that like the mass market will be interested in it. And then like how does that pan out? How do professional musicians, professional audio manufacturers still yeah, justify their products, their work? Um, I think that's, that's very interesting. And regarding these like I, I create only the music I want to listen to, I think uh, I read some stuff about like you basically create your own bubble um, and I think this will kind of divide people. You don't ha cannot talk about music anymore because you're like, oh, I just listen to the music that's specially created for myself, and it's not like something like that, yeah, like helps to connect people. And I also cannot imagine that like people enjoy going to concerts, like just listening to their own music. So I feel like there's still a chance to create something that a lot of people like that they can talk about, that they can share together. Because I mean, the the live event is will still be important, I guess. Um, yeah, that were the two things. Well, it's music as art and how important is art and art is what makes humans humans, as a lot of people would argue that, but then there seem to be people who can get by without art and maybe that's the thing. There are already AI karaoke jukeboxes. So that's already happened, you can't patent that one. I mean, to some extent there's, I think, already, there are already examples of this through the development of technology going all the way back to the you know, push button organs and with drum patterns and chord patterns, and they're stimulating in a certain way for a certain period of time for a certain kind of person and a certain kind of activity. And so we can sort of divide the activities by you know, defining creativity and defining, you know, are we trying to create something to commoditize or because it's art or, you know, sort of there, there are different ways of slicing this and then thinking about applications. Um, and I think all of that rolls up into all of these other questions about so what, what informs the models and, and the, the, the tools themselves that are then going to be used in these different use cases. And hopefully the, I mean this goes back more to the Brian Eno quote, is how will we break it? How will creative people break the tools? And that will be really interesting. And one thing that I've never seen, and again this just occurred to me but I'm not going to patent it, is the ability to get the neural networks that can be trained but to get your own data set so I can train it with things that have nothing to do with each other and see what comes out the other end. And I think those kinds of tools would be awesome and please build me one. <laughs> Um, okay. Yes. Hello. Yeah, uh, I just, I, I've had a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings come up throughout the conversation. So a few things that I was thinking about is, for example, uh, I don't think it's as trivial or as simple as we're kind of, dis when we discuss it sometimes we just get carried away with the surface level of things and we forget that there's depth to everything. So for example, like Andrew's idea, uh, you can do that, you can have something that creates a playlist for you, but as human beings, as like how we are biologi biologically designed, we get bored as well. So at some point you're gonna get bored and you're gonna want to have exposure to something else. So it's like, it, it's with different things like, and music like as such, you can create a playlist that you like, but at the end of the day you're gonna ask another person because as we share, music is like much more than just listening to something you like. It's also about sharing, it's also about relating to another person's experience, their emotions. And I guess when you listen to a song, you have your interpretation, but you really enjoy watching your artist's interview or something where they explain where it comes from. Because it's much more bigger than just listening to music with some instruments. It's, it's not that, it's, it's a lot more detailed than that. And we are very complex beings in that way. And the other thing that I was kind of thinking about was that like, of course, the way the jobs are right now is going to change. Like, there's no fighting about it. When the Industrial Revolution happened and things that humans used to do, like even in factories and stuff, and they got automated, a lot of people lost their jobs. But that also created new jobs, right? So I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, how things are going to change, but things are going to change, and we are going to find a way to adapt to it and use it creatively in different ways. I mean. 
Yeah, I, I really don't know. Probably when like since came people who played violin and like virtuoso instruments felt very threatened by it. But we learned how to use it in a very creative way over time. Instead of it controlling us, it became something we could control and explore and ways to do something very different from something we had never perceived before of what it could be. So I guess there's more depth to all of this than how we kind of try to look at it. Uh, yeah, th that's Thank you. Much. Um, so we, we're about, yeah, uh, 10 minutes or so away from the end of the session. A um, couple of things I just wanted to say. Uh, first of all, a reminder, surfacing ideas and perspectives is important. We're hoping to use some of this as inspiration for things to think about, especially within the technical committee, and there's an invitation to join the technical committee if you're so uh, inclined. Also, just a quick public service announcement, next June, First weekend in June, put a placeholder in your calendars. We're going to have a full-on symposium around AI and music in Boston at the Berkeley College of Music. Details to be announced later, um, but I just wanted to, to put that out into the air. And so we've got uh, the one mic in the back and then one on the side. Yeah. So going back to uh, the question about how do we think the next year's AI is going to be used in music creation, I just re recently saw that AI was able to predict if a song was going to be in the top 100 of Billboard. I have a feeling that labels are going to use this, or not even labels, creators, to see if their melodies is, are catchy enough to be uh, sang on a stadium, things like that. I think it's gonna, we're going to have not only tools to create music, but to inform ourselves on how good music is based on what we want to achieve with it. Um, that's just a comment. And on the other side, um, related to labels perspective on this, on that copyright office meeting, the Universal Music was there. And their perspective was very clear, especially around voice cloning. They're super against it because I think they want to take over it and, and make it part of their of their con contracts with their artists. That was my, my view of them being so against, like, against it being free, like regulating it. This is what they wanted to do, to say regulation over voice, it shouldn't be happening, we should, ghostwriter, the ghostwriter shouldn't be happening, we should regulate it, and I guess it's because they wanna maybe own it as part of the, but apparently voice can't be owned, so I don't know. Um, I think thought. the first part of your question goes exactly to what the last person said, which is that, you know, will we be able to figure out what is going to be a hit, which goes, right back to the very first thing I said, and the answer is no. Because what makes it a hit is what makes a joke funny, it's what makes a movie scary, is the surprise, because it's not something you would ever expect to happen, so that will come outside of what we generated from a data set. I mean, the data set is everything with the training, and you can't train a data set with something that's never existed because it hasn't existed yet. So that's where the connection will come. That's where the next thing that will connect people will come from. So I know I'm making it sound like a dystopian universe of generated music and everybody doesn't talk to everybody else, but that will be for the recreational listening, for the casual listening. But I think that the human connection to art will always be there and that's what will save us all. I, just a quick thing on the on the hit song prediction. I when I think about that, I oh, no. I mean I think of it more like predicting the stock market, right? So yeah, it's basically kind of like that. And and, and when you, when you look at like stock market prediction, it's kind of like what you were saying. You're definitely not gonna the further out you want to predict, the harder it is to get it. But maybe we can predict the hit song that is happening five minutes from now, right? And maybe that's feasible. But as you go further and further out, yeah, the it, your, your your confidence interval gets much much wider. So. Uh, I think obviously labels are extremely interested in that and invest a lot of money, but you know I don't know if it's yeah you can't make any guarantees right it's just a prediction no one knows so yeah I agree with you overall. <laughs> yes. Um, just kind of going back to the topic of this whole block of like what is something AES can do. Um, one of the things that's on my mind is how most of these AI tools kind of operate on the level of they need the whole brick of audio, you know, clip of audio at once. They do something to it and then they spit it back out as kind of a whole whole chunk, um, and that that is pretty uh, different from like the VST plugin workflow, right? Where it's like it needs to stream in and stream out at you know almost no latency. Um, I one of the things 
things that has crossed my mind is it would be incredible if there was a plugin standard that like Ableton and you know everybody else supported that you know could take these chunks of you know take these chunks of audio and do something to it and render it back you know not in real time and you know then you know on the plugin you can like you know go off to the internet to do a GPU call or you know whatever else you need to do and some sort of standard for a um, you know, for making that sort of plugin, I think would really open the door to the open source community and you know all the people who are currently making Google Collabs for their drum demixers, they could now be making these plugin things for you know uh, for you know Ableton and everybody else in a uh, in an environment that we're used to. Thank you. I, I do just want to say I, I I think the the things that we're noticing where the current generation of tools are addressing whole chunks of audio, it's because those are the easiest things. Those are the sort of the first generation. It's like, yeah, I can look across an entire thing and measure spectrum and change the spectrum. Um, and so um, I, I want to encourage people to think more deeply about you know, the shorter term things and the more interesting nuanced aspects of sound and what can, we, you know, what can we measure, what can we learn, what can we curate in terms of an outcome. Um, but I, I think that's, that's partly why we're seeing that. I think a great place to see what people are thinking about also is ADC, the Audio Developer Conference, which is in London in November. But there are tons, they do lots of it online. Everything is streamed. And that is a very good look into where people's heads are at because most of the people that come do work for companies. But that's not what they talk about. What they talk about is what they do in the hackathon. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating to see where they're looking. Yeah, hi. Um my mine is more of a question than a comment. Uh, so, uh, what do you think are going to be the added responsibility? Like, looking at it from the creator's perspective, like as musicians, um, like for example, taking it uh, in another domain, when when we started to realize that uh, the the data that we are sharing, like location and other metadata like that, can be used to train uh, ML networks to do things. Uh, we started getting more settings that said, oh, don't, my, don't share my data, or we had more control over what we were going to share. So similarly, from the content creator's point of view for music, do you see any added responsibility or probably any lesser responsibility uh, in terms of when they're making the content, is there going to be something uh, involved there and what, what we should be aware of? I feel it's all about... Um, quality control, and it goes back to what we were saying before about, well, if you train a model with only your stuff and it spits out something new, and you just like, yeah, whatever, whatever it spits out is fine because it's been trained on me. If you do it 10 times, there's going to be one thing that the artist will respond to more, and so I suppose it's almost a curation thing. That's the least that needs to be done on the output of these tools, is for someone who might do the thing themselves to say, ah, great, and to be inspired by the output and then take it further, as opposed to just cranking out gizmos and putting them into the world. So I think we have one more question, and then after this, there's one thing on Slido I'd like to get to before we run out of time. But. Okay, so this is an opinion regarding Christian's first question, and I'm also curious about your opinion. So uh, I think... Uh, I think it would be always great to uh, uh, like encourage uh, like open source AI music production tool because I want uh, I want I think it would be great if the amateurs are encouraged to play with that AI tools. I think one thing that AI tool now lack uh, compared to other uh, like paradigm shifts uh, in music production history is playfulness, I think. They, the AI tools doesn't feel like playful. It doesn't feel like a playful toy that I want to play with. But you, you, I think you have seen at the opening ceremony the producer Hank Shockley enthusiastically explained his teenage and 20s years that how he played with all these new digital like tools like as if they are like a like a toy and i think uh like but like 
if it, for the hardware, it, we can anyway open it so and play with it and do experiments with it. But when it comes to software, I think we have to uh, encourage to make it as a open source so that amateurs can play with and do some radical experiments and find some kind of new artistic territory or another some or some way to use AI as a new artistic medium, not just a tool. So that was my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for the comment. So, so with the last five minutes, I think one thing that came up on Slido, and, and I think it's great, we, we didn't, I think, get, spend enough time in this area, so, so we should really focus on it now, was, you know, I think the, the comment said something like, you know, the, the high school essay is dead because of chat GPT, right? But, you know, a big part of the AES is education, right? And so as these tools, begin to proliferate in the audio area. I mean, how, how do educators react? How do they evaluate the craft? And uh, so, so, you know, I'd, I'd love to get a discussion going kind of on, on that side of things with the last few minutes. Yeah, I'm just interested uh, to hear others' opinions on it too, but <laughs> You know, maybe 20 minutes ago, before Andrew ruined my whole perspective on the future, You're welcome. <laughs> I may welcome. have thought, hey, maybe an AI could be cool to reverse engineer something for someone, especially in the context of like how Isotope did it, where it's sort of using an interface that it's not, for, for an example, Adobe generates images, and it's either good or it's not. And you can maybe coach some things with more prompts, but it'd be cool to have something set up the plugin in a way that achieves a certain goal and then look at that but then take it a step further and sort of tweak it and i don't know i can see that being helpful for students especially if a tool was dedicated to doing something like that i had the thought just about as a first step to answer this last question and the question you had previously uh, on the slide uh, Gordon, which is, uh, it seems that it would be useful to identify the different categories that the TCL MLI is serving, and at least I can think of two. One is the people who make the tools, uh, where that would be more my category, and I, I feel I don't, I wish I would know more about all the ways that ML techniques can be used to do a better job with my work, and. The other category are people who use the tools. Uh, and we, we talk about both. In other words, uh, where do you find tools uh, that take the best advantage of uh, ML techniques and AI techniques? These are two categories, but maybe there are more. But starting with that is maybe useful. Yeah. Having had the experience of going through Berkeley, uh, mp &E, and then working professionally in Los Angeles for four years, I feel like there was a, a gap in curriculum between what was the standard and then what is the standard currently. And maybe that current standard is always a moving ball. But I would encourage, I think, educators to really embrace the new technology and to incorporate it as quickly as possible into the curriculum because that's really what students are going to be handling and dealing with more than legacy techniques in my own opinion. Yeah, talking about my class. <laughs> or my class. But I, I think that also goes to the point that, and I was kind of shocked that ChatGPT came out less than a year ago. That's sort of insane. So some of it is hard to keep up. The pedagogy is hard. The knee-jerk reaction was to ban AI from education in a lot of places because it was impossible to know what was what. And just really quickly back to the points the last three people made about the playfulness and where to do it. And I think the problem right now is that the only way AI tools are being used in audio is generating output. And it's when we can control the input or control something that happens in the middle is when we will break things in a really fun way. You can't break something that's already been trained to a certain extent. So I think we, we've just got one minute, so I, I see two, um, two mics, two active mics, so if we can keep these brief. Yeah, um. yeah uh, from an educator standpoint, uh, I had a student last year, English not her first language, wrote a paper entirely with ChatGPT. It was terrible, but it posed some really interesting concepts that then we were able to take and redraft. So I think in an educational perspective where mistakes are cool, 
idea generation is cool. We don't have to necessarily worry about the end result, but let's give us some things to now generate to talk about and redraft. Michelle? Yeah, and I was, I was gonna say that uh, as far as preparing students four years from now, uh, when the technology is going so fast that we can't even come, you know, keep up with two weeks from now at this point, there's all, it's so quick. So I think uh, to your point, we need to teach them how to learn. Um, we need to teach them how to be critical about what they're hearing, what the AI is doing, and their interaction with them. If we can do that, however that might look, uh, I think we can prepare them to keep up with the technology. Okay, so they, we keep getting times up signs, so I, uh, <laughs> I, I think I know what that means. Uh, yeah, I, I think thanks everyone for coming. You know, the, the Slido is staying open for a week. You know, you can find the TCML AI on the AES website. Please, please join. We, you know, we want minds and, you know, and we've got the event coming up next June as well. So, so things are going to continue. Please keep the conversation going. I don't know if anyone else has closing thoughts, but thank and you so survey, much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>